So today on this gorgeous bank holiday Monday, we are filming a segment for a virtual country show, um, which has been organized by the guys over at Hey TV on YouTube. So they're bringing all different people together and ours is going to be the vintage tractor segment. So I'm going to slot in to the filming. Starting to look like a good lineup. Looks like we've had a breakdown. God, what an amazing lineup already. This is incredible. You've never lined them all up together before. What do you think? It's impressive, we're talking about it. It's a perfect day for it. We have to wait. And last but not least, as you can see, they're getting bigger, bigger each time. Are you wearing that? Yeah, Is that what you'd wear at a show?
I've, I am a, I'm head of, head of costume and I say you have to spruce yourself up a little bit, but. Very nice, very nice. Okay, so for the purposes of our YouTube channel, would you like to explain what is happening today? Well, because of all this lockdown and things, today would have been Carrington Steam Rally, for that the first major outdoor event of the year, which me and my brother try and get to, and because of the virus is all locked down, so we thought we'd line our few tractors up for you, and I'll talk a bit about them. Well, are you desperate to go? Desperate, no. Well, she'll do. I shall leave me while over oh, dinner. The sheep will come rubbing at calves. Well, right, okay. Just put me into the yard. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll hang on. Then. So they're not staying here for long. I feel like we should put it. People should come and uh, and look at them and leave a donation. Yeah, the Hamishes are on it. The first one to show is a 1948 Fordson Major E27N. This tractor was Fordson's, uh, after the war, very keen to bring out a new model, the standard Ford, so the Model N, which the, the standard Ford, which was effectively known at, was in use all through the war years, but was out of date. And Fordson were desperate to bring a new tractor out because sophisticated tractors are coming in from America, etc. And this was it, the E27N. And a lot of even Ford fans will say they were rather outdated when they came out but that's because of the wartime restrictions it's basically the same 1917 side valve engine upgraded to 30 horsepower a more efficient rear drive and of course with the option of self-start which this has got hydraulic lift which this one hasn't got uh, and they were sort of a basic but a good tractor they're in production from 1945 to 51 often referred to as a stopgap tractor, but 250,000 were sold and they, uh, yes, they did a job. It just came with two gearbox variants. There's a low box and a high box. The low box did about four and a half mile an hour in top gear and the, the high box about nine. But the problem with the high box, you were very limited. You don't need sort of two gears for field work, unless you did a lot of road work. The, the high box one wasn't terribly good. But uh, yeah, Fordson Major, E27 and built at Dagenham, England. This tractor was registered on January the 1st, 1951, so it's actually a few months older than I am. No comments. A Ferguson TE20, TED. TE stood for Tractor England, and the variants were A, D, and F. A was petrol, D was TVO, and F was diesel. And while the standard Fordson was a sort of tractor which would say won, you know, won the war on the home front. This little Fergie revolutionised agriculture with its revolutionary three-point linkage, a feature which was brilliant and so ahead of its time and that every other manufacturer's copied ever since. Ferguson was a genius, but also I think quite a difficult man to work with. He fell out with David Brown, he moved to America and fell out with Henry Ford before he came back to England and started to build his own tractors at, at Coventry in, and uh, in the old, I think he used the engine, basically it was a standard car engine. And also Fergus was a great lover of the petrol engine because they were very powerful and easy to maintain and sort of cheap to build. And this was okay because I don't know how long it had been going, but throughout the war years until about 1947, there was re-agricultural petrol or a cheap rate petrol. And that was axed in 1947, despite lobbying from Ferguson. So we had to bring out a TVO model fairly quickly. And they brought it out in 1948. Uh, this is a 51 version. And they were, yeah, quite a good track, quite a good tractor. It enabled a small, lightweight, compact tractor to do a multitude of tasks on the farm, providing you had the equipment, you know, to go with it. They're in production till 1956. Uh, literally half a million were made, and many are still in use today in Australia and New Zealand, and of course in the you know, up in the Scottish Highlands. You see them it's still in use and doing the job they were designed to do. Uh, Ferguson didn't bring the diesel engine out till about 1954. But again, they were very, very good tractors and sold. Well, Fordson tractor sellers called them the grey menace because they were absolutely everywhere. They were the, uh, everybody's idea of an ideal little tractor. 
Well, again, this is a 1951 David Brown Cropmaster, and I've just been informed it's registered in July 1951. David Brown, I say, had ventured into the tractor business. David Brown were initially gear manufacturers, and I think, I think still are. And if you go to Land Dudno and ride on the tramway up the Great Orm, the station where you change over to go to the top, you walk past all the winding gear and it's stamped David Brown. Well, this is, this is they. David Brown had built the legendary Ferguson Brown from 1936 to 39 before they fell out with Ferguson and then built their own tractor, the VAK-1. Of course, that was very much interrupted with wartime production and many found their way onto RAF uh, sites. One or two farmers around here that we knew had them and they were very good little tractors, but it was the Cropmaster in 1947 which put David Brown firmly on the map as a major British tractor manufacturer. They were brilliant tractors, slightly heavier than the Fergie, appealed to sort of farmer contractor types. Whereas the Ferguson, you say, was like a two for a tractor plough, the Brown Crop Master sort of a three for a tractor plough. A lot of people regarded them as the roll, the uh, fast track of the day, really. There were two seats, uh, six speed gearbox, you got this cowl around here, which kept heat from the engine in and also protected you somewhat from the weather. And again, uh, this is a TVO model. David Brown did diesel engines from 1949. Uh, and again, a six-speed gearbox, which again was quite an advancement because Fergie had four. The old Fords at the bottom had only three. So they were really were very, very ahead of the field. The most popular tractor David Brown built, 50, over 59,000 of these were made. And I <coughs> go as far as to say possibly one of the best tractors David Brown made. Uh, we used to have them on the farm and I spent hours on these with a single row Bamford Wolfler in fifth gear, flat out, boy you can uh, cover some ground. This has also got the Bur supply by Burgesses, Stafford, the nice name plates on, and also the original uh, tyres. So again, a lot, I think this tractor hasn't done <coughs> a mountain of work. Jump the years a little bit, 1967, Massey Ferguson 135. Ferguson had sort of, well, joined or amalgamated with Massey Harris. Uh, for a while, the Ferguson made their own 35, it was called the FE 35, then they became the Massey Harris Ferguson, then the Massey Ferguson 35. But it was 1964, Ferguson had a relaunch for the Smithfield show that it called the Red Giant Range. There was the 130, the 135, which is this, 165, 175, all available with multi-power, and they were really very, very good tractors. Ferguson used to advertise in the farming press in the 60s that one in every four tractors sold in the UK wasn't just a Massey Ferguson, it was a Massey Ferguson 135. And it sort of capitalised a little bit. Ford had also introduced their thousand range at the, at the Smithfield show, but one or two, they had engine issues with one or two models, and Ferguson just really capitalised on that. It's got the Perkins engine in. This tractor is a local tractor supplied from a dealership which is worth much more than a mile and a half from where we're standing now to a farm just north of Bakewell and it's been on this farm since 1981 and has done a lot of work. For this first 10 years we were there and it did all the scraping and shed cleaning and you name it, it did it. And if you look at the steering wheel it's, you can see it's down to the metal in places and it's done over six, the clock stopped at 6,000 hours must have gone seven, it's, the engine's never been touched. In, 96, in 2009 we put new mud drives on, sprayed it and just rebadged it, but the engine is, is original. A cracking tractor. Nuffield, well, I've also had a great affection for Nuffield tractors, going back to me but a little boy and riding around on the contractor's M4. Uh, William Morris entered the tractor market in 48 at the Smithfield show with his M4 Universal. A very good tractor, modern design, five-speed gearbox, very well built, very popular with farmer contractors. And they were built at the old Wolseley plant at Ward End, Birmingham. Uh, and throughout the 50s, you know, people regarded them as mainly the Rolls-Royce of tractors. They were very good tractors. I moved to Scotland in 1960-61 to a purpose-built plant at Bathgate. It was a little bit troublesome, as you may expect, going to a new plant, and there were bits of issues with engine problems, and I'm afraid the Nuffield name took a bit of a hammering. Also, by 1967, their tractor was still the basic 1948 shape, whereas Fords and Ferguson all had sort of revamps. 
So this was their new track. There's only two models, the 465, which is this, and the 345. And I think people were a bit downy on them at the time, thinking, oh, no field. And there were issues, you know, engine balancing was an issue, and liners blowing was an issue. But once sorted, they are good tractors. The fact of how many are around still today and, you know, going and going well is, is a testament to them. And I'll even put my neck on the block and say, I think they're possibly one of the most underrated tractors of the 60s. You've got 65 horsepower, 10 speed gearbox, hand operated clutch and fast, I mean, I call this one the Overland Flyer. Really good tractors, but, and they sold reasonably well, but maybe not as well as they would have hoped for because customer confidence had taken a bit of a knock. So only in production for maybe three years and the Nuffield name was dropped. And the uh, Leyland was born and the Nuffield name just appeared on the side badge. Yes, in 1969, the, Le the Leyland tractor was born. And again, they were. Uh, this is a cracking tractor. I love driving this tractor. It's a uh, four-cylinder engine, which I, I do quite like because they run smooth. And again, there's so many of these still around and doing work today. They were a, a good tractor. Unfortunately, people think of Leyland and you think of stoppages and all this lot. But I feel that the maybe tractor division was sort of sold off to, to prop up other things. And they were bought by Marshalls and ran for a while, but then I'm afraid they were no more. One of the unusual features that my brother just pointed out, the gear formation, you've got gears in the low box that were sort of slower than gears in the low four in the low box, sort of slower than I-5 in the fast box, but uh, they were a good tractor and I enjoy using them. I'm really glad to have these two British uh, built tractors here, both built at Bathgate in, in Scotland. Now we change breed completely. These uh, MTZ tractors from Belarusia started arriving in this country about 1969. Basic, it's not a basic, is really the understatement. Basic and sort of crude, but heckishly reliable and good solid tractors. Very, very cheap. And a lot of them worked hard and then when they went wrong, just left. So I, I wanted one of these. And to get one in really good original condition like this was quite a, a boost. It's obviously been quite well looked after. Uh, it's got the fenders on and no, no dints. There's a lot of international influence with these tractors. The, the engine sounds a, a real international ring to it. It's really, I really enjoy using it. We do work this on the farm. Production was from about 1962 or three to about 80. Uh, and as you'd expect with an East European producer, so the, you know, the figures were colossal. So about 1,250,000 of these were made. It's still very much in demand today for export for places like India and Pakistan because I'm on the Belarus UK Facebook page and someone's put pictures of this doing various things. You get all these guys from Pakistan saying, I need this tractor, how much price, please? For the simple reason, there's no fancy stuff. You can mend them, you'll need a hammer, a chisel and a set of mole grips and you're sort of sorted. Just to give you an example, if you have any problems with the hydraulic pump, leaking or o-rings you've not spent half a day taking the cab off it's all just there under the under the seat cracking good old tractor coming to the last of the david brown badge tractors david brown had their relaunch in 1965 at the smithfield show it was supposed to be the selectomatic range which was a talking feature but it was the color scheme david brown had gone from hunting pink which was the crop master color down there to a nice red and yellow livery in the 60s with the emblematic range and they went to orchid white and chocolate brown well farmers been quite traditional it was sort of frowned upon quite a bit and i heard on in a somebody put on facebook if it's true or not that they knew somebody who bought one and they wouldn't let it go out of the, into the field so they painted it red so i don't know if that's true or not but i can maybe believe that David Brown exported colossal numbers of tractors and won the Queen's Award to industry in 1966 and 68. Uh, and it said the colour scheme white and that was for American market where they are, I believe they were marketed by Boland's tractors and that was their colour scheme. So it sort of tied in to have the, have the same colour. This is their own David Brown engine. Uh, and this range, nine, nine, there's 885 and 995, 996, 1210. Good tractor, but the cabs were quite difficult to get on and off. But it's quite a narrow door. And my uh, friend's mate bought one new back in the day, and he asked him if he liked his new tractor. 
and his reply was, well, I do, but I've got in it. But, uh, yeah, David Brown sort of maybe stretched themselves a bit in the late, uh, where are we, 60s, and in the early 70s, were amalgamated with Case, and I thought that was more a takeover. And for a while, it was David Brown Case. And then the David Brown name was dropped, and it just became Case. You think, yeah, the writing's on the wall. And then Case joined with International to become Case International. And production was transferred to the old uh, international plant at Doncaster. Eric Melford Mills' plant was closed. But now, uh, Case, of, not, not even in Doncaster, the, uh, I think made in Belgium. So Britain, who once led the world for tractor production, uh, we don't make anything now. I think of it the JCB Fast Track. And I think that's just out of the reach of most ordinary farmers, but that's yeah. how it's gone. This is the tractor that does all the work on the farm, a 2010 registered Valaris 952 variant 3, 105 horsepower turbo with a loader on. Uh, built at the uh, Mintz tractor plant in well, Belarus now. Bel Belarus. We, we tractor boys say Belarus, if you go in there for holiday you'd say Belarus. The Mintz tractor plant is one of the largest tractor plants in the world, it employs about 20,000 people. A new tractor rolls off the line every 10 minutes, the export to every country in the world. They're built under license in many. And whereas Massey claimed in the 60s one in every four sold in the UK was a 135, Belarus claimed one in every 10 tractors sold as a Belarus badge on it. Well, that's their figures, not mine. These tractors are again uh, basic as regards not having a lot of electronic gadgets, but there's far more attention given to operator comfort, a nice cab to access, gear controls all the side out of the way, air comes available, it's not on this one, but just the blowers. Well, that's basically it. We've got I've shown you tractors from production here of 1948 to 2010, built at Dagenham, Coventry, Meltham, Bathgate, and Minsk. So I hope you enjoyed that. So a few questions from me. Which is the fastest tractor? Well, this is the fastest tractor. You've got what we call a 40k gearbox. And then which one? Uh, maybe the Muffield 465. Fast? Yeah. Okay. Which has done the most work? Yeah, the 135, definitely. Uh, which is your favourite, if you could only keep one? Excluding, like, for work reasons, just favourite personally? I suppose I like the Nuffield 465. Well, the working tractors are the Blaris at the top, which is used you know, every day for everything. This one here is also a working tractor. We do all the muck spreading with this, uh, muck carting, rolling, and just a good four-wheel drive tractor to have about. Now, the ones with the out cabs on, we do use for springtime work for harrowing, but they'll get, uh, we've run two hay bobs, so they'll have a hay bob put on each of those uh, for the summer, and they'll do all the hay bobbing. And then the, David Brown we use for bale carting uh, and the 135 the same and the, the old two at the bottom are literally just fun tractors or road run tractors. What a great lineup. Really good. Um,
so that's a wrap. Hope you've enjoyed it. Weren't the tractors fantastic? And Dad's knowledge is incredible. I'm really amazed by how much he knows about the tractors. He should be um, he should be doing it. He should be doing it at the country shows. Thanks for watching.